Spears, and it interrupted our talk about the Holy Spirit, but not really, because it had the same theme as Pentecost has. And so VBS, Pentecost, and the Ten Commandments, remember, we are in Exodus. We followed the, the Israelites out of slavery via the Passover into the desert. They have been given the ten or tender commandments of the Lord, the good Father, giving them a law that establishes what is right, but also establishes their rebellion. And in that, then, we had VBS week, and they kind of lead us to the same place, to this verse. This is from Galatians. Paul writes, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. Follow the Spirit, and you will not follow so much the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. The body fights the Spirit. Do you know that to be true? For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you're not to do whatever you want. He talks more specifically about the fruits of the flesh, but then goes on to talk about the fruit of the Spirit and says, the fruit of the Spirit, capitalized, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of God at work in your life is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. There is no Ten Commandments against these things. This is where it ties together. Now, we would all want the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. What's interesting, though, is we don't, we don't run up to an orange tree and say, make apples. Do we? We don't even run up to an apple tree and say, make apples. If you think about it. The, the one command we don't need to say is, be fruitful to something that is a fruit tree. We've got to get it water. Oil, oil, water, air, sunlight. Don't give a tree oil, (laughs) right? And soil. If it has those things, it will produce what it was meant to produce. Let's go deeper. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So my encouragement to you today is going to be in this realm. Those who belong to Christ crucify the flesh. He says have crucified the flesh. That's true with its passions and desires. That's true. But we still feel, as Paul says, the old man, wretched man that I am, who has strapped me to this body of death, Paul says, it's still there, but we're to keep in step with the Spirit. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit. We had Pentecost two weeks ago. Part one and two, we discussed what happened at Pentecost. This week, we're going to talk about what it means. Now, a quick review of what happened. Pentecost celebrates the 50 days after Moses gives the people the law. It's a harvest festival. It becomes a a reception, and it signifies the receiving of the law. It signifies the receiving of the harvest of the field. It was perfected by the Christian Pentecost which talks about the harvest of eternity. The Jewish Pentecost was the giving of the law, what man must do, and remember, we can't do. According to the way Jesus interprets the Ten Commandments, we failed them all. But when Christian Pentecost came, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, we discover what God has done for us. Okay, we talked about how it's 50 days after Passover and 50 days after the crucifixion. The Jewish Pentecost was a birth of a nation, the Jewish people. The Christian Pentecost was the birth of the church. And finally, the Jewish Pentecost says God will provide. At Christian Pentecost, celebrated in Acts, 50 days after Jesus was uh, ascended and cruci- uh, crucified, and before he ascended, it was God has provided. His spirit alive now in the believer. And so in Acts 1, Jesus says, before he ascends, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea, even to the remotest part of the earth. 
In the rest of Acts 2, we hear the details. The people, after hearing this, they're gathered together. A violent wind comes upon them. They begin to have the gift of languages to witness to Christ in any language. They're given understanding, and suddenly the church breaks out. And Peter, who's been afraid, suddenly becomes bold, and he says uh, to the people saying, y'all are drunk. Peter says, they're not drunk. These men are responding to the gospel, and to the Jesus you crucified is now long-promised Messiah. The one you killed is the Lord and Messiah. And the people say, what do we do? And and Peter says, repent. And the church is born. From that moment on, we're living in that age. We're living in the age where the spirit becomes available for the believer. That's the age we live in. Jesus said this would happen before he was crucified, though. And here's where I want to go today. In John chapters 13 and 16, here's the setting. Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. The disciples do not understand what's going on. He wants to tell them, and he begins to tell them. They've just had the Passover meal. They've had their feet washed. They've been told to love one another. Jesus then says, don't be afraid. In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come back and take you to be with me so that you can be where I am. And Thomas says, we don't know what you're talking about. How can we be with you? We don't even know the way. And Jesus says, I'm the way. And the truth. No one comes to the Father but by me. What he was saying was, I will take you there. And then he says this, if you love me, keep my commands. And his command was to love one another. And I will ask the Father, the good Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Do we get what's being said here? We're being told that God will give his spirit to us, to live in us. If you've lost a father or a mother that you loved, you long to be connected, don't you? You long to see him again. You long to have some sense of their presence. Jesus is saying, I'll be with you. I'll send my spirit who will be, live with you and be in you. And I will not leave you orphaned. I will come to you. So he's saying, I'm leaving, but I won't leave you alone. Before long, the world won't see him anymore, but you'll see me because I live, you'll also live. So that Pentecost day was Jesus by the Holy Spirit coming back. And on that day, Jesus says, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. On what day? Well, for the church on Pentecost, they realized, oh, Jesus is here. He's off the cross. He's not on the earth. He's here by his Spirit. But the day you became a believer, I hope you realize Jesus is here. You receive his life in you. Jesus says, all this I've spoken while still with you but the advocate. Now, so what we're talking about now is I want to celebrate and and talk about the third person of God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's interesting, the the Trinity's right here. Jesus has been talking about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all in this part of John. But I want you to know how loved and how present God is to us. And, And the church gets its orders from the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, all this I've spoken while still with you, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. I don't give as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Amen? So let's review real quick. The Holy Spirit is a person. God with us. Not an it. In John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another advocate to be with you forever. The spirit of the truth. You know, the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Have you ever tried to convince somebody by logic that Jesus is Savior? And yet, have you ever just started to explain to somebody and they break down and their heart is melted and and you don't even know why they're ready? Because the Holy Spirit's doing his work. How did you come to believe in Christ? And this is how it's possible to become like Christ. What we talk about in our our mission statement here is for you to become like Jesus. You become like Jesus as you let the Holy Spirit 
run your life. We'll say more about that. The Holy Spirit gives that life. If you trust Jesus as your Savior and come to need him, if you see your lostness, if you repent of sin, if, if when hearing Jesus, for example, say, whoever believes in me, rivers of life will flow from him. If you find yourself needing God, if you find yourself becoming aware of your brokenness, the Holy Spirit's already starting his work. Amen? The only giver of life is the Holy Spirit. When Lazarus was, when Jesus' friend Lazarus was sick, Jesus let him die so that he could show us this. He came to the sisters and they were mad. Why'd you, why, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus weeps with them. He understands our mourning. But then he, he demonstrates his power and he calls out, Lazarus, awake. Now let's just, let's do a little grave practice here. Lazarus is stone dead. You think his ears are working? There ain't nothing working. Doorknob dead, as they say down south. God had to open his ears. Amen? God accomplishes what God's word says. And the challenge to you and me is to believe it. That's it. We tend to think the doorway is I got to earn it. No. The doorway to knowing you're saved is believing you're saved. Again and again, the book of John, believe. 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 For God so loved the world that whoever believes, right? He gave his son so that whoever believes. John 5, 24, whoever hears my word and believes the one, the father who sent me and believes has eternal life. They cross over from death to life. And the Holy Spirit gives you the want to. This is the miracle. This is why we're reformed people. We believe God does all the work. But you have to believe it and receive it and trust it. But, but the basis of it isn't your worth. It's the love of a father who wants his child rescued. Amen? The basis of your salvation is that God doesn't want you lost anymore. And, and, and only the Holy Spirit can wake somebody up to where they're really at. If you're working with somebody that you love and you want them to know Jesus, pray for them. Ask the Father who wouldn't give a scorpion. Amen? Ask. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. The Holy Spirit witnesses us, witnesses to us. And we keep hearing this word advocate. I'm going to move quickly. The Holy Spirit is our advocate and our helper. I love this from Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the very Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Even when you're praying, God is interfering to hear your best word. I heard it said once, that scripture that we had in our assurance of pardon, when a child asks for a fish or a, gets a stone or a scorpion, the, the, the Greek words are close to each other. Let's say a child mumbles or says the wrong thing. Some people grew up with vindictive and hard-hearted people. And boy, they, they, they're literalists. And if you asked for a peanut butter splamwich, then you were going to get a peanut butter splamwich and not a peanut butter sandwich, right? That, you know people like that. And what God is saying if you asked for a scorpion or you meant to ask for an egg and you said it differently, God knows what you need and he will give you what you need because he's good. Amen? That's true when we have cancer. That's true when we're doing just fine, so we think. If we look for what God is doing, we'll see the good father behind it all. And even when we pray, let's say you're broken, you're hurt, you're struggling. Just pray. God knows what you're really saying. Isn't that comforting? I had a dad like that. He knew what I really needed. He knew when to say no and when to say yes and when to give me, you know, somebody who's saved for education. Is somebody looking out for me? Because I would have used it long earlier on more baseball cards, I guess. The Holy Spirit is God with us to comfort, to teach, and to warn. 
You are not to be orphans. Okay, so we're talking about the Holy Spirit who, who does these things for us. But how do we live by the Holy Spirit? How do we keep in step with the Holy Spirit? How do we live the Spirit-filled life? I'm going to go back to an old tract I read when I was 17, and it changed my life. Because it helped me understand how I could keep in step with the Holy Spirit. And I call it getting real with God's presence. The Bible tells us there are three kinds of people. This is scriptural. There are natural people just living in the flesh. Carnal people, which means flesh people, but we'll see. And then people led by the Spirit. They use this diagram. You're going to see three of these. And you can even jot these down in your notes if you want to or put them down in some other way. But the circle is sort of one's life. And the little dots are all the stuff that goes on in your life, might be important in your life, relationships, jobs, situations. The S is yourself. You're directing your life as you steer through all the other things that happen. The cross, Christ, is outside. So let's describe the natural person. Those who are natural, unspiritual, they don't receive the gifts of God's Spirit. They're foolishness to them. They, they don't understand why you go to church. They don't understand why you want to live by the Word. They don't understand why you give the way you give. They just don't get the way you live. We call this the self-directed natural life. God is outside that sphere of that life. Ego or self is on the throne. Christ is outside the life, and the interests are directed by whatever that person feels. That's the natural life. This is what we would call the carnal person. Self is on the throne. Christ is inside their life. They know him. They may even have acknowledged him as Savior. But this is what Paul writes. Brothers and sisters, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as carnal people of the flesh. As infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you're still not ready, for you're still of the flesh. For as long as there's jealousy, quarreling, see these aren't the fruits of the Spirit. As long as there's fruits of the flesh controlling your life, you're of the flesh. For as long as there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh, behaving according to human inclinations? And so this, this represents <clears throat> places we've been. If you're honest, self is still on the throne. Christ is not allowed to direct the life. He's there. You might have a, a saying above your door. You, you might want Christ to run your life, but you're discovering that frustration that there's, there's no spiritual control in your life. Now, this is a character. This is sort of a picture. As we move to the next phrase, uh, the next picture, you're going to feel like in between some of these, some of you. Some of you are realizing uh, there's nothing. I got nothing with God. What do I do then, Pastor Kirk? Pray. Ask. I, I'm, I'm a, I have no spiritual life. Let me, let me say something uh, that I've discovered. If you realize that, God has begun something. Am I right? If you get to the point where you're like, man, I got nothing, you got the first thing. Amen? I got nothing. I'm broken. I'm a mess. Oh, the Holy Spirit has started to shine on you because that's the only place we all come from. When I do my counseling with folks and, you know, they say, well, I feel like a hypocrite. Sign up. Welcome to the club. We're all been there. But I'm only coming to Jesus because I need something. Come on in. Amen? Who came otherwise? I came to Jesus because I came to the end of me. I found out I was a fraud and a fool and a joke. I needed help. And, and, and here's what happens next. We come in and we, then we're carnal. We're young. We're grown. We have to decide, am I going to enthrone Jesus or is he just going to be in my life? Oh, it's good enough. I got my life insurance. But then I'm going to live my life. That, no, there's more for us. There's more. It's called the spirit life. He who is spiritual appraises knows the value and the order of all things. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. You will be my witnesses even to the remotest part of the earth. We're talking about the Christ-directed life where the advocate is on the throne. So the Spirit of Jesus, His Word brought to us by the, by the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. 
where self yields, where the interests are directed by Christ, where we have harmony with God's plan. Now, if you're like me, you're a combination. Amen? This is where analogies don't work. This is where graphs fall down. I, in any moment, can live like a carnal believer. Right? When I don't obey what the Spirit is saying. And so it's in, it, it behooves me, if we're going to be led by, the, led by Christ, if He's going to grow His life in me as I read His Word, the Holy Spirit begins to talk and say, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. And the, and the longer we walk with Him, the more intimate that conversation gets. And my encouragement to you as believers whom Christ has saved, you're now children of God. The, the, these last two people are saved. This, this, this guy's saved. He's just living a fruitless, spoiled brat life, right? Remember my encouragement to you? Once you're a child of God, the decision you have is, am I going to grow up? I want to grow up. And so I want my life to be led by the Lord. So here it is. The Spirit-filled life is the Christ-directed life where Christ lives his life in and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. As I preach this, I know that there, you right now are starting to do some math, and there's something in your life. There's one major thing that's in the way. And for some of you, it's on the throne. And maybe the whole reason we're going through this sermon today is so that you can finally say, off. I know that that doesn't belong there. It could be alcohol. It could be fear. It could be bitterness. It could be I, anything. And it's taken the seat of who you are. And it's, it's determining your identity. And I'm just saying, brothers and sisters, you have the freedom, the authority by virtue of Christ. The advocate is the one whispering in your ear, it's time to go. It's time to end that. Let it go. Amen? Let it go. Give it over. Trust me, I'm good. I got, it's, what, what the Lord has for you is better than that thing on the throne right now. Is it fear? Is it concern about the future? Is it political activity? Is it a relationship with a child? Is it a substance that you can't live without? Is it a drug you're taking? A, 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 a something that's beguiled your brain? Porn? Anything. It could be anything. And the, and, the, and the advocate is saying, it's got to go. We experience Christ by obedience. That's it. Are we saved by obedience? We're saved by what he did. But we grow up step by obedience step. Amen? What's he saying? So here's what I would say. And they're on the banners. It's why they're here. It's our church's foundational statements. Receive. If you need to be rededicated today in your heart and your mind before the Lord, just receive it. It's a beautiful thing. What do I mean by that? Believe and become accountable to the truth about you, the truth about God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So if you've come to realize, man, I'm broken, I'm a sinner, I'm needed, or I'm lost, whatever God is saying to you, just, just, just sit in it and become accountable. Because the, the, the deeper truth is, I am loved, I am redeemed, I am saved, nothing more need be added, I am sufficient based on what Jesus, His sufficiency is enough for me. It's enough. Amen? Receive it. Let it sink. Deep, deep, deep. You are a child of God because Jesus made you a child of God. If you believe that, you're saved and you can't be unsaved. Because once you're a child, I tried it with my kids, you can't be an unchild. They can embarrass you, but they can't not be your kid. Amen? And how do you do it then? So you're here today and you're saying, oh, I want that, but I don't feel it. Ask. Just ask. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that prayer answered. Dalton Gilbo, remember, used to play our guitar up here. I know some of you wouldn't know Dalton. Came to play in the band because we recorded music. Had no desire to know Jesus. And we asked him to ask. And he gave his testimony six months after that. Uh, a young girl in our youth group 
Same thing. I've seen it so many times. If you're that person, just ask. Hey, you've received. Now respond. Worship. Proclaim your faith. Get in the word. That's it. That's your first obedience is say, thank you, Lord. The first thing we do as a church is we worship. That's why our church is set up this way. That's why we built the gym second. The first thing we do is worship. Amen? Because that's our first response. When you've received something, you say thanks. If you haven't received anything, it doesn't matter. And then renew. Obey daily, deeply. Just keep in step with the Spirit. Have somebody you can talk to. Have somebody you study with. Your daily walk with a good father. Be in the Word. Technically, you could be a Christian without anybody else as long as you had the Word. That's not how God does it. We need a church. We need each other. And and we're being renewed day by day. Become like Him day by day. And this is the process of the apple tree becoming an apple tree. At no point do you say, Bear fruit. No. Receive, become, be. And if you be being long enough, baby, apples are going to start falling off you. Amen? It's the truth. That, people say to me, you know, after VBS, a couple people from different churches said, why is your church so fruitful? And, and I honestly, because... You've learned to be his. Amen. It's just years of seeking, receiving, responding, renewing. And giving becomes natural. You're a generous people because you're a people who've let the Holy Spirit make you generous. And when have I yelled at you to be generous? I don't have that power. I don't even have the power to tell you to believe. I just point to the one who does. Amen? And release. You know, with my brothers here, I thought I'd be a lot more funny and vivacious. (laughs) But I'd rather be this. Amen? This is just meat. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit. And I know that's true. They're in conflict with each other. So you're not to do whatever you want. But the fruit of the spirit is love. So this is only said at the end. Do you see love growing in your life? Joy or peace? Any of these fruits, do you see them falling from your tree? Because only as I've been trying to follow Christ, then I look back sometimes and I think, boy, if there's not much under my tree, I've got to go back to my father and say, what have I done? <laughs> you know, what am I missing? What, what soil have I stepped out of? What water am I not letting fall on me? What sunlight have I avoided? And God, who is good, pours it on me. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your simple word today and pray that it's been a blessing to your people, an encouragement. We've walked all the way around the Ten Commandments and this Pentecost. This fruit now, this harvest, is you. As you seek to live your life in us, Father, we just open our souls and our spirits to you. Show us where we've become self-directed. Show us where we've become reliant on something that's not of you, that's just a cheap imitation. Show us where we've as Josh showed, you know, accepted foil when you had shade and taken an empty, broken aluminum can when you had water. And thank you, Father, that you've come to rescue and to give your children the Holy Spirit. I ask it all in Jesus' name, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Having received, we give. We, we,